Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Imagine what life would be like as a slave. We think of the cruel practice abolished in the United States over 140 years ago, but slavery is more common today than ever. A BBC News article, Millions Forced into Slavery on May 27, 2002, says the number of people forced into slavery around the world has risen to 27 million. That's hard to fathom. The idea of physical bondage is so foreign to us today. We take great pride in our freedom. Patrick Henry echoed the sentiment of many when he said in 1775, gentlemen may cry peace, peace, but there is no peace. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Martin Luther King's memorable I Have a Dream speech nearly 50 years ago now also centered on liberty. King waxed eloquent using the words from two songs, let freedom ring and free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Ordinary activity comes to a halt on July 4th. The bank, the post office, and other institutions shut down to observe Independence Day in honor of our freedom gained from British tyranny. In the sweltering heat, people line up one day that week for parades and swarm public parks to watch fireworks light up the sky. We're free is the unspoken message. Most of them are not really free, but try to tell them that. That's precisely what Jesus did to a similarly self-assured people in John the 8th chapter, beginning with verse 31. There the Bible says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. As prophesied in Isaiah 61, spoken in fulfillment in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus came proclaiming liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who were oppressed. But the people were revolted that he dare offer them freedom. But there it is. Jesus came to bring true freedom, a freedom found only in a declaration of dependence on him. Every Lord's Day, in fact, is Dependence Day for the Christian. Jesus was telling the Jews on that occasion that they were in bondage, enslaved to sin, and he held the only key to the chains that bound them. Their response, who do you think you are? Don't you know who we are? We are descendants of Abraham. We are in bondage to no one. Forget their oversight that the Romans were running the show in Israel. Their bigger problem, they were shackled by sin. Jesus told them, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Sin held dominion over them. They were in bondage to sin. But they're not the only ones. The same truth applies to all men everywhere. Until you know the truth, until you obey the truth, you are enslaved to sin. Stay with us. You hear from the Bible what it means to be redeemed after our song.
People get it all backwards today like they did back then. Just as men in Isaiah's day called evil good and good evil, put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, Isaiah 5.20. Men today call freedom bondage and bondage freedom. Some folks mangle and confuse scriptures like Galatians 5.1 and Galatians 3.13 and suggest they teach we are not obeying the law of Christ. We are not bound to obey the law of Christ as found in the New Testament. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Galatians 5 verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. These scriptures do not obliterate, obliterate rather, all law, but teach instead that we are no longer bound to the law of Moses. Hebrews 7, 12 says, For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. Not elimination of the law, but a change of the law. The New Testament is 2,000 years old, and yet it's as relevant as today's newspaper. We read in 2 Peter 2, 19, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. This describes many professing believers, like a dog that snarls at anyone who tries to stop him from lapping up his own vomit. The man in love with the world says, I'm free to drink, free to do drugs, free to have sex, free to touch, free to lust free to entice to lust, free to be unequally yoked, free to worship my way, free to spew hatred, profanity, and vulgarity. The Holy Spirit says, such individuals are not free at all, but are rather slaves of corruption, overcome and brought into bondage. These men are shackled, manacled, and bound to sin. Freedom? Don't buy the devil's lie. Don't lose sight of who you are. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget why Jesus exposed himself to the big mess we made down here. Jesus came from heaven to pry us loose from sin, to redeem us, to ransom our souls. The Bible says in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. What does it mean? to be ransom. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says a ransom is a price paid to secure the freedom of a slave or to set free from liabilities and charges. We had a debt we could not pay, a debt only Jesus could, and thankfully he did. The words ransom and redeem are interrelated. We read in Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Thayer defines the word redeem by payment of a price to recover from the power of another, to ransom, buy off, metaphorically of Christ freeing the elect from the dominion of the Mosaic law at the price of his vicarious death. Another Greek word translated redeemed is defined to release on receipt of ransom, to redeem, liberate by payment of ransom, to liberate, to cause to be released to oneself by payment of a ransom. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed from the curse of the old law that contained no provision for full and complete forgiveness of sins. And I've been adopted into Jesus' family. Again, we read in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. When we sold ourselves into sin, the devil had a claim to our souls, for the wages of sin is death. But Jesus paid the ransom. He paid the debt for our sin on the cross to purchase our freedom from sin and death and offer us the gift of eternal life. Redeemed, 
how I love to proclaim it. Listen to the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. You were not redeemed with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Did you get that? You are bought and paid for if you're a Christian. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Please understand, this transaction makes Jesus more than the personal Savior we hear so much about today. Perhaps this is part of the difficulty in Christendom. Maybe this is why there is so little commitment to Jesus' teaching, so little conviction to live a certain kind of life, to engage in certain activities and not in others, to communicate in certain ways and not in others, to frequent certain places and not others. The Scriptures teach Jesus is a personal Savior, but more. He is Lord and Master, and He expects nothing less than complete surrender. The question is not, are you a slave? But rather, who's your master? Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Being his slave is not a curse, but the greatest position of honor and privilege man can hold. In Titus 2, 14, the Apostle Paul addresses our obligation as slaves to this loving master who freed us from the cruel taskmaster and brought us into the household of God. Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. We are His own special people. We belong to Him. Therefore, we're holy. We're not like everyone else because we have a different master. We march to the beat of a different drummer. That's what Paul meant in Galatians 6, 17 when he said, From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Jameson Fawcett and Brown's commentary reads, Marks branded on slaves to indicate their owners. So Paul's scars of wounds received for Christ's sake indicate to whom he belongs and in whose free and glorious service he is. A.T. Robertson writes of these marks in his word pictures, Slaves had the names or stamp of their owner on their bodies. Today in a roundup, cattle are given the owner's mark. Paul gloried in being the slave of Jesus Christ. This is probably the image in Paul's mind since he bore in his body brand marks of suffering for Christ received in many places, probably actual scars from the scourgings. You see, we're freed from sin to become slaves to righteousness. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6, verse 6 and 11, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Get it. Sin is a choice. Take charge of your life. Don't be a victim. Reject the sin that tries to creep into your life. Again, Watch how sin is a choice, Romans 6, 12 through 14. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace." You cannot serve both masters. 
you must make up your mind. Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Can't you see? You're not powerless. You choose your master. The decision is yours. You serve righteousness through obedience or you serve unrighteousness through sin and disobedience. Romans 6, verse 17 through 19. Notice the thread of slavery all through this passage. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawless of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. If you are a Christian, you've been set free from sin and Satan. Isn't it time you started acting like it? Don't sell your soul back to that cruel taskmaster who wants only to use you, abuse you, and see God refuse you. Stop trying to serve two masters. Don't you realize what a cruel master Satan is? Why live as his slave? That would be like choosing Pharaoh over Moses. Seneca tells of a very rich Roman freedman, Vedius Polio, who allowed his flesh-eating fish to dine on his slaves when they displeased him. One day as a slave carelessly broke a crystal vase in the presence of some guests, including Augustus Caesar, Vidius commanded that the slave be thrown into the fish pond. In answer to the slave's cry for help, Augustus commanded all the crystal owned by Vidius be brought before him, broken up and thrown into the grisly pond instead of the slave. Vidius is the kind of master Satan is. Jesus redeemed us from all that meanness. He ransomed our souls from the auction block of sin and brought us into his household of love, warmth, and generosity. Don't run away from this master to go back to the monster. Romans 6, verse 20 through 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. As a young man, John Newton suffered as a slave for 15 months in Africa after he thought he was hired by a wealthy merchant. His conditions were so abhorrent, the natives despised him. Despite his harrowing experience after his rescue, Newton eventually became captain of an 18th century British slave ship. The horrors and barbarities he describes later aboard the ship are sickening. Thankfully, a horrific sea storm finally brought John Newton to his senses. At long last, the captain of this slave ship who one time suffered the personal abuses and indignities of slavery himself, forsook his devilish ways to become a preacher, songwriter, and abolitionist. He wrote the fol following song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. T'was grace that brought us safe this far, and grace will lead us home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. And we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. 
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Knowing John Newton's background makes this song even more meaningful. Amazing Grace is Newton's best loved hymn, but he wrote hundreds of others, many echoing the theme of bondage and freedom. In one, he wrote, Beneath the tyrant Satan's yoke, our souls were long oppressed, till grace our galling fetters broke and gave the weary rest. Jesus, in that important hour, his mighty arm made known. He ransomed us by price and power and claimed us for his own. Now freed from bondage, sin, and death, we walk in wisdom's ways and wish to spend our every breath in wonder, love, and praise. Ere long we hope with him to dwell in yonder world above, and now we only live to tell the riches of his love. Only Jesus offers true freedom. This morning, break the yoke of sin and take his yoke upon you. Listen to Jesus pleading in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Sweet is the song I am singing today. I am redeemed. I'm redeemed. Please stay with us after our song, and we'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message. Jesus, What was the Holy Spirit talking about when we read in Romans 6, 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, the slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Earlier in the same chapter, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Freed from sin, 
freed from death and brought into true life in Jesus Christ. We're so glad that you joined us this morning. We hope you will watch the program every Lord's Day and then join us for worship at one of the congregations listed shortly. We hope you go to LetTheBibleSpeak.com if you have a computer where you can uh, watch videos of the program or view transcripts or hear podcasts of the program at your convenience. Call or write for a free DVD copy or transcript of 868 Redeemed. You can also request a free six-lesson Bible study by mail. We close with the words of the Apostle Paul from Romans 16, verse 16. The churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.